friends, I, uh, I may or may not have forgotten how to do this. It has been a few years, so if you'll bear with me, I may be a little bit rusty. So I put together a chat for you today about mentorship and sponsorship, as well as uh, some technical storytelling that I enjoy doing. I put these slides together and I brought them here to ESPC and I was told immediately that apparently the use of Comic Sans is considered unprofessional. So already I have failed you all. Uh, I apologize. I will do my best to solve that with an improved font. So I hope that we as a collective can move past my error. And then I was told uh, by Magnus that uh, having black text on a white background is too plain, and he suggested that I find some evocative stock photography. So I was thinking about where would I find some stock photography and what should it be of? It should probably be of a programmer's desk, maybe a real, a real programmer's desk. So I found this desk um, that I think represents truly all of our desks. Uh, it's really representative of a typical Typical developer's desk, would you not agree? Then I thought I would bring a picture of my desk to give you a sense of what that might look like. And I want to point something out, though. I made a little joke there, a little tiny joke, where I said a real programmer. And I said that on purpose, because I wanted to point out that when we do stuff like this, we see influencers on TikTok and on Instagram telling people, young people, early in career people, what they need to do to get into tech, they often show it like this, and they say this is what a, a programmer's desk or a techie's, techie's desk looks like. But then I go and turn around and I juxtapose it with an old man's desk, and I want to make sure that we all can agree that it doesn't matter whether your desk looks like this or looks like this, you should feel welcome in tech. Because any desk, if it has a computer on it, is a real programmer's desk. Can we agree on that? <laughs> so, I just need you to do that as many times as possible. Just, I've got my hype person here. Here's a little pro tip. If you ever go and do some light international conference speaking, any of you, I would recommend this. What you do is you find someone over on this side to nod. I'm just waiting for any of you to crack. No one here has smiled or nodded yet. So they're, I'm not enjoying this side. And then you find one person over here, and I've already got Heather right here. Woo! Just Woo! randomly. So now I look here, and then I look over here, and I'm trying to get this gentleman here to nod or something. There we go. Ah, oh, he just nodded. So now I don't care about the other 1,500 of you. I just go like this. I look at you. I look at you. Good? You happy? You happy? Yeah, we're happy. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how you do it, a technical talk at an international conference. Cool. So let's talk about attitude and style. Uh, during, the, during the pandemic, or as my kids call it, the panini, during the panini, uh, we saw a lot of hustle culture, a lot of people that were telling folks what they needed to do with all this spare time. You ever hear anyone say, you know, if you didn't learn Chinese during the pandemic, what were you doing with all your spare time? All right, this was your opportunity. We had a whole pandemic. You were locked in your house. You should have learned SharePoint. You didn't do it, and now you'll, you'll, never, you'll never succeed. And we saw influencers like this telling us to work harder and try harder, and it was too much. It's too much. I don't like this. I reject hustle culture uh, as much as I can. I think that tech should welcome us warmly. And I'd, li I'd like to see a return to things like this. This is a, one of my favorite magazines from March of 1984, where this young lady's got her bubble gum and she's programming on her TI-99. And that's where I grew up. That's the environment that I grew up. And we hear a lot of talk about inclusion. We hear a lot of talk about diversity. Uh, but one of the things that we want to watch out for is artificial diversity, or what I call pie chart diversity, where you put together your united colors of Benetton, where you have one of each kind of person, uh, and you say, look, we've done, we've done something that's diverse, but we're really missing the point. Now, there's a popular quote around diversity that says, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. That's a, that's a pretty good quote. It's a fun quote that people like to use, but I also don't like that one as much because I think that inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee, right? We always talk about how we, sh we need to make a seat at the table. Well, who built the table? Maybe we need to have a table building committee. Let's build a bigger table. Let's build a table of a different shape because inclusion is far more interesting to me, and this is my preference from a words perspective, than diversity. Diversity tends to be coded language. 
its coded language around gender and race, but inclusion is very specific. It is the explicit opposite of the word exclusion. How do you know that you're including people? By not excluding anybody, by making sure that you are open arms for everyone. And inclusion and diversity as it uh, comes from that is all aspects of one's personality, the, the pie chart of one's privileges and the pie charts of one's identity. Um, I happen to have an invisible disability. I'm a type one diabetic, so I have an insulin pump. And I was actually invited to speak at Novo Nordisk earlier this morning about that. I have this pump on my arm and I have an implant in my stomach and I have an open source artificial pancreas that's connected into the cloud and my blood sugar data goes up there. But the thing that's significant is I don't have to tell you that. So my little checkbox of diversity goes away when I go like this. Not everyone has the opportunity to do that. But does that need to be known? Does it matter from a programming perspective? I suppose it does if I'm working on healthcare because I can offer a different perspective. And that different perspective is really interesting. And wanting to present my perspective on a diverse team is, uh, is something that's important to me. I went and made an Xbox avatar so one can go into the Xbox store and buy an avatar so that kids can see their insulin pumps or their uh, continuous glucose meters. But being able to simply go like that and say that's invisible is, is important. Um, and recognizing that some people need to see that and some people don't. In fact, one time I had a low blood sugar on stage and I was in the middle of the talk and I took some glucose and I made it out of that low blood sugar and I didn't really think anything of it. But then a, a gentleman came up to me afterwards, he was a father of a diabetic son, and he was kind of in tears. And I thought that was a little dramatic. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, my son was diagnosed just a few months ago, and I just don't know, I didn't know he could have a job. That's silly to me. I've been diabetic for 30 years. I'm traveling the world. I'm doing all kinds of things. Yes, it slows me down, but it hasn't prevented me from doing anything. I didn't realize that this individual needed to see that. So when we hear about representation matters, it's not just Black Panther 2, it's not just more women in tech and more women in CEO environments, it's whatever you've got, and everybody's got something. For someone to see you, any one of you succeeding with the thing that you've got, whether it's invisible or dis invisible, is important because it's gonna make someone say, oh, well shoot, I can be in tech too. If, if Hanselman can do that, then I can do that. And then if you look at, again, the pie chart of identity, that is really, really important. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not hoarding knowledge. The technology priesthood has been a thing for very many years. Now, this is, again, no disrespect to anyone who doesn't like the analogy, but when we think about priests, and I mean priests circa 11th or 12th century, they were the ones who could read. They were the ones who had the book. And the ones who didn't have the book, they would say, they would say, here's the book. Da, 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 da. Don't touch it. Just look. Look at the book. Oh, you can't read? I'll read the book to you. That is gatekeeping. I don't even want you to read because if you read, you could write your own books and we can't have that. The same thing happens with software that we make that's too complicated. It's too sophisticated. It's unnecessarily complicated and we create this technology priesthood. Knowledge is power and tends to be hoarded. Experts in any field rarely want people to understand what they do. Doesn't that sound like something that could be on Twitter in 2022? 1974. So this is a problem and has been a problem for many, many years. And what we want to avoid is we want to avoid gatekeeping. That's what's great about conferences like this and why conferences, user groups, discords, social networks, anywhere that you can go, can you avoid a gate that prevents someone from getting there, whether it be ticket prices or student tickets or free tickets or opportunities to come to a conference like this. If your company can pay for you to come, can your company pay for an additional ticket for an underrepresented or even better, an underestimated person? Uh, I heard someone say that I should stop saying underrepresented people and they, I should start calling myself overrepresented. I thought that was actually pretty cool. But I also like the term underestimated. If you're historically underestimated, if you are from a, a culture or a community that maybe hasn't had the opportunity to come into tech, let's do what we can to make that available to you. So then what can we do? What can we do as technologists who are all here? Because one of the things that you don't realize is that whether this is your first conference, whose conference first time they've ever been to a conference? 
Oh, I, lo I love that you picked this conference. That's fantastic. Okay, who, who is like the 10th conference? 10th, look at this. Do you know people who've been to 10 conferences and people who've been to one? That for every one of you, there are at least a thousand who have never gone to a conference in their entire lives. Never thought it was useful, never had the opportunity, don't have a training budget. That's a huge thing. Just the fact that you're here is a kind of privilege and what an amazing privilege it is. I would encourage you to let other people know about these conferences. Spread the word, bring a friend, have your company pay for an extra ticket, have your company expand their travel budget. If you liked this conference and you saw yourself maybe speaking at a conference like it, could you work with your local user group and be a first time speaker? Do the small rooms and then the big rooms, organize a regional code camp. Be someone who is not a gatekeeper, but someone who shares their energy. I've talked about this many times, and I'm going to mention it multiple times in this talk. Don't waste your keystrokes. We're going to hear about that in just a little bit. What we can do is we can put out good work. We can share our experiences and talk about the work that we're doing at our company, the work that we're doing in our communities, and that energy will come back to you. Now, I mentioned before that I'm not a fan of hustle culture. Um, I think that uh, there are programmers on YouTube and on social media that are telling you that your job is to wake up, kick ass, and repeat. Um, I think we can be a little bit more balanced in how we do things, a little bit more friendly. We found that out certainly during the pandemic when we learned that uh, there's a big difference between remote work and being quarantined. I've been remote at Microsoft now for 15 years. I was remote before it was exciting and fun to be remote. So then the, the panini happened, and everyone called me and said, hey, Scott, uh, you know how to do remote work. Tell me all about it. What's the secret? I said, remote work is awesome. I can go to Starbucks, and I can go on a train. I can, I can do work, work anywhere, but this isn't that. This is being stuck at home. This sucks. Quarantine work sucks. And then they're like, well, you know, if you don't learn Power BI while you're at home, then you're wasting your time. It's like, man, if you survived the pandemic, you're probably killing it. I don't know why we all felt this pressure to overwork. Isn't it funny? As a remote worker, I loved my job. The pandemic happened. Nothing changed for me except I worked two additional hours a day, and I feel more pressure to overwork because I want to make sure that they see me at work. That became a huge problem. And then, do you all know what revenge nighttime procrastination is? Do you know about this? This is when... You work hard all day, and then you take revenge on your job by staying up late because you're like, I'm going to get my damn day back. And the way I'm doing it is by staying up till freaking 2 a.m. doom scrolling. <laughs> it's revenge nighttime procrastination. And I'm not going to think about the things I need to do. I'm not going to take care of myself. I'm just going to stay up late. And then I'm going to rinse, and I'm going to repeat, and I'm going to do it all over again tomorrow. So what the pandemic has taught me about how the way I share information and how I put that information out into the world is I try to be as deliberate and focused as I can be. And in doing that, hopefully, I uh, will survive uh, this experience, and we can get back, as we are seeing, as Magnus pointed out, back to uh, some kind of normal here. Being deliberate and being intentional and being present is really, really important. So at home, in my space, I went and I made a nest. I think nesting is important. We saw during the pandemic that suddenly we saw our coworkers' homes. We never signed up to see their houses, right? You ever see how, you know, Fran from accounting is a slob. That's that's why we made that's why we made a Zoom blur filter or a Teams blur filter. I don't need to see your house, Fran. Clean up. But she says, "Well, I didn't come here so you could see my house. I don't need you to see my personal space." We saw one lady at work who actually is in her pantry, and I said, "What are you doing in your pantry?" And she's like, "Well, it's really small and it's got snacks, and it makes me feel very cozy." I went and I just took my spare bedroom and I made a space for myself. I would encourage you to do that. Some homework for you is to go home and make a nest. Put, put up a credibility bookshelf. <laughs> credibility bookshelves are very important during the pandemic. I would encourage you to do that. You have to have like, you know, Calm and ActiveX and Internet Explorer 6 books. You can find these at any thrift store, uh, right? Original SharePoint, 
uh, type stuff, these are very important books to have. It shows that you know, you mean business, right? Uh, so that, that, that book that you have on ActiveX that's holding up your monitor, get that out from underneath your monitor and put that back up on your credibility bookshelf uh, and the, you'll be vice president before you know it. You watch, it's gonna happen. Um, so in making this space, you're being intentional about how you're gonna create and whether or not the things that are in front of you feed your spirit. A lot of us just found ourselves in uh, a pantry or in the kitchen or in a spare bedroom. Uh, I went and I you know, painted my walls and I made a space and I put up the things that made me happy. And in doing that, I started asking myself, was this the time for me to get more involved in community, to help more people get involved in community? What is the best time for me to create? You should ask yourself that. Are you a morning person? Are you a nighttime person? When your day is not working out the way that you want it to, are you doing revenge, nighttime, procrastination? And can you catch yourself when you're doing it and stop doing it and think about, all right, what could I do that would make me feel better? I used to try to watch as much Netflix, and then the harder my day at work was, the more Netflix I would try to watch. And it would just make my days worse because I was up late watching Netflix. And I started thinking about, well, how can I write more? How can I create more in ways that make me happy? So I found TikTok and I found YouTube. And after 20 years, 20 years of blogging, every Tuesday and Thursday for 20 years, I took a freaking break. I gave myself the permission. Every week someone emails me and says, are you gonna start blogging again? I will when it feeds my spirit. But I did it every Tuesday and Thursday for 20 years and I deserve a break, I got tired. But I found my energy on YouTube Shorts and on TikTok and now on Mastodon and I'm exploring different spaces as opposed to putting all of my energy into one thing. Now, a lot of early in career people will say, well, I don't, wanna, I don't know what I want to talk about. I'm not an expert. Everyone is an expert at something. I hate hearing from people that, oh, I'm not technical. I very, met a very nice young person earlier today, and uh, I, I kind of coached them in the moment, but I also picked on them a little bit because they said, well, you know, I, I'm looking to get into the technology, but I'm not technical. Don't apologize for not being technical. You're in a non-coding role but you are technical. That's super important. Never, ever apologize for not being technical. Technical is a spectrum. You are an expert at something. Give, give speeches on getting into tech, on getting involved in tech. Tell us about how you did it. Well, I don't want to write a Python 101. Those have all been done. The perfect Python tutorial has already been done, but it hasn't been done by you. The perfect onboarding into SharePoint hasn't been written from your perspective. We've seen people who've been in the biz 20 years. I want to hear what you think about how M365 and Graph work. Which brings me to the concept of conserving keystrokes. I feel really strongly about this. And I want you to listen very carefully because this is super important and it's gonna get real dark real fast. Buckle up, buttercup, here it goes. You have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. I made a website. You can go there now, it's called keysleft.com. And you can put in how old you are and how, how fast you type. And I'm gonna tell you how many keystrokes you have left before you die. And then, if you scroll down a little bit, I'll tell you how many books are left in your fingertips. And how many computer programs. And how many love letters. And how many emails to your boss. And then you start to realize, I could be emailing my boss, or I could be writing love letters in the, right, the great Scandinavian novel. This is super important, because after this talk, let's say that one of you sends me a note. I don't know you. You seem nice, lovely people. Say, hey, Scott, great talk. Here's a question. That question is itself, by definition, a gift. You have given me the gift of your attention and given me the gift of a question. However, I don't know you. I'm not gonna give you the gift of 2,500 of my keystrokes. I only have a couple million left. So I'm gonna go and type out 12 paragraphs and I'm gonna email it to you and you're gonna say, thanks. And I will never hear from you again. Why did I do that? Well, hang on, Hanselman, I thought you said we're supposed to pay it forward and we're supposed to help the next generation and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, but not on email. So where do those keystrokes go? Where should those keystrokes go? Anywhere with a URL. 
email is where keystrokes go to die. Take those keystrokes, put them in SharePoint, put them in OneDrive, put them in OneNote, put them anywhere. Put them on freaking Wikipedia, I don't care. And then send a link to that in the email and say, great question, thank you for that gift. Here's the answer. And then, here's the trick, you go to sleep and you take a nap and you wake up and you say, 10 people visited my blog or my SharePoint or my whatever. You just got free keystrokes. I have been writing in my blog every Tuesday and Thursday for 20 years. I took a break this year. My blog still gets a half million page views every month. That's free karma. That's free karma. Oh, handsome, and I don't want to write a blog. That sounds like a lot of work. There's medium. There's long form. There's ways. There's wordpress.com. I don't want to hear your excuses. What I want to hear is that you're going to stop emailing people at work that don't ever read your emails. And I want you to put that information in Docs, in Markdown, in GitHub, in SharePoint, in Word documents, anywhere that has a URL. And start emailing people those URLs and then go to sleep and watch your keystrokes multiply. Woo! <laughs> just, I gave her like five bucks beforehand and it's just the best five bucks I ever spent. You're, you're just really you're outdoing yourself. I appreciate it. This is really, she's putting a lot of pressure on you on this side. I just got to <laughs> let you know. He's a little more muted. He's like, yeah. Tuck. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the other thing that I discovered in my, in my many years of, uh, of software is that we're all amateurs. I used to get more... Um, excited about how much experience that I had in, in, in tech. Uh, this is, I have been in tech 30 years and six months. So, so what? We're, there's, we're all amateurs, there's no professionals. People are always doing that, oh, I got 20 years experience. Okay, you know, is it the same year 20 times? You know that person at work, we can talk about them, they're not here. First time tech uh, conference attendees, you're here. This is a fresh, new, and interesting year. I'm honest with myself. 30 years experience, about seven, I was basically asleep. Do I have to put that on my LinkedIn? Like 30 minus seven years, 23 actual years and seven years of just kind of dicking around at work on Reddit? All right, you gotta ask yourself, like. Because what that means is, if we call back to the conversation around deliberate practice, am I present at work? Am I thinking about the business problem? Am I thinking about the customer? Am I thinking about my own personal improvement? I am being honest with myself that I spent some years not exactly phoning it in, but just not present. So I try to wake up as much as possible. And by wake up, I mean, you know, when you're driving and you're like, and like three blocks went by, and you're like, oh shit, I'm driving. I should probably wake up, you know? Or you miss your stop. You have to turn around and cross the tracks and then go back the other direction. Wake up as many times a day as you can. Sometimes on a random Tuesday at Microsoft, I'll just go, what the hell am I doing here? And that's important because it's a moment to recenter and ask myself, you do this, come on, you must, this is not a... It's okay to do, here's the other thing. I love that you're laughing about this. We don't talk about this stuff. You think it's just you because you're afraid to tell your coworkers because then they might find out that you don't know what you're doing either. We should talk to each other about that. I'm doing okay, but I've been coasting on charm, Heather, for at least 30 years, wouldn't you say? I don't really know what I'm doing. I've just been Googling with Bing the whole time. <laughs> So I, I did joke a little bit what I was saying, like, you know, if you didn't learn, you know, whatever, Chinese or Python during the pandemic, what were you doing with your time? Over the last four and a half years, my family and I went and uh, got our black belts in Taekwondo. So I'm a first Don Taekwondo black belt, which means that if you are uh, a small, frail person, oh, please, if, if, if you're a small, frail, older person, I could probably knock you out. So if you need me to take out any any elderly 
people, I'm your guy. Um, now, in, in the doing of this, it was very challenging because we were all moving at different levels and we coordinated such that we could land at the same time. But I'm a first Don. How many Dons are there? Well, it turns out more than one. Uh, uh, so the, the, the master who taught us is a ninth Don uh, who's been doing it since like 1963, right? You know, like taught Chuck, Chuck Norris type thing. So he celebrated our success, and I felt like we had achieved something. We have arrived. Black belt, watch out. I'm here. I made it. I'm a black belt. And he says, all right, good job. Now the work starts. Now the work starts. What about, I don't care about any of that. You've got another 40 years of hard work in front of you. That's an important reminder that we are not experts. This, what I thought was the ending, was just the start. Do you all know who this gentleman is? Tim Berners-Lee, Sir, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, knighted by the, I don't know, the British, I don't know, the ominous Nabiscum, Shreddam, Weedham, uh, the British Empire. Uh, noted, he invented the World Wide Web. You know that he didn't put senior next to his title. <laughs> well, what the hell am I supposed to do? He made the internet. You know what would have been a real flex if he had just put the? <laughs> Imagine showing up with a business card. Oh, yeah, Tim Berners-Lee, I've not heard of you. The web developer. Oh, the web? Yeah. <laughs> All of it, that was me. That's a flex. But he recognizes that he can't know everything, so I appreciate how humble and chill he is. And this is important because if you want to be a mentor, or find a mentor, you're never too old to get good advice. I misunderstood how mentorship should be. I got 30 years experience. I'm old, I'm thinking about retirement. I should take my oldness and lecture a young person every week. Gather around, young people, let me tell you about Microsoft front page. And, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's talk about nested tables and transparent one-pixel GIFs, shall we? <laughs> ah, one-pixel GIFs, that's a name I haven't heard in many years, yes. My degree, all the languages that I learned in my software engineering degree, they're dead. They don't exist. Why did I get that degree? I didn't learn a thing. What I learned was how to learn. I had been thinking about mentorship wrong, so I started looking for mentors. I am no more qualified to be taught about Kubernetes than I am to teach about Kubernetes. But there's some excited young person out there who could share their knowledge and their background on how cloud native works so that I might better understand that. I could find a young person to share that experience. So I started thinking about mentorship differently. And rather than having a relationship like this, old person, oh, thank you, old person. Oh, yes, I have knowledge, which is OK. We find ourselves doing that, but this is about waking up. It's not bad. If you, if you should think to yourself, oh, crap, I'm doing that. I have a mentee. I lecture them weekly. And then I go, aha, I'm a mentor. But what we need to do is we need to really think about what it means to be a mentor, and we need to think about how are we being a mirror for them, a version of them in the future, helping them define their own dream, helping them identify their strengths, not mine, I'm not trying to turn them into little mini Hansel people, right? I want to advise them. But I also want to acknowledge that most people, are you ready for this? Most people, including underrepresented people, are over-mentored. I don't need your advice. I need sponsorship. So what is this being a sponsor? Sponsorship is being a spotlight, is creating luck. Literally, the creation of luck by lifting people up into new spaces. Now, this is a really challenging thing. For an old guy like me, I did it all by myself. I worked super hard, and I made it happen. And you should, too. It's not working out for you? You don't work hard enough. Right? We've heard this kind of stuff before. But what is luck? What is the formula for luck? It is being prepared plus opportunity. You can't have luck if you don't have both of those things. Did I work hard? Absolutely. That just meant I was ready for opportunities. 
However, I don't know where those opportunities come from. Have you ever had an opportunity, you did the thing, you were amazing, and then maybe six months or a year later, you find out that it was your friend that recommended you for the thing? You thought it was all you. It doesn't take away from your ability, from the thing that you did. I don't know who recommended me to come and speak here, but I'm not just sitting up here on stage chatting with you thinking I did it all by myself. Somebody out there told them that this talk might not suck. And they made an opportunity for me. And I was ready for it. Luck plus opportunity, opportunity plus being prepared equals luck. So I'm very lucky and I recognize my luck for being here. But it doesn't diminish that I had to be prepared to do it. But somebody out there created that luck for me. So here's a funny thing. I can make luck. I have a, a lot of cool privileges. Now, a lot of time in, the, in social media and uh, in the U.S. particularly, we think about unpacking one's privilege. We hear about uh, uh, race and uh, age, and we hear about gender. But one of the privileges that we don't talk enough about is level privilege at work. When you get senior on your name, people email you faster. They answer your emails faster. Has anyone ever gotten a promotion? The title changed, and then suddenly people are answering my emails really fast. That's level privilege. You get a VP title at Microsoft? Holy crap. you got to be careful. There's literally a person at work who told me to watch out for the Hanselman Blast Radius. I said, that didn't feel good. What's the Hanselman Blast Radius? And they said, we know that you, Scott, tend to be up at night doing crazy stuff that you shouldn't be doing, like, you know, messing up .NET or something. And, you know, it's 11 o'clock on a Friday, and you're messing around, and then you find a bug, and then you email the team on a Friday. That's great for you, but then you go to sleep, and then you wake up, and you don't realize that you have interfered with the lives of all of these different people because a person with a certain title just woke up people on a weekend. Therefore, the blast radius of me going, hey, I found a bug. Is this a thing? Oh, God, I had someone's found a bug. Frantic, frantic, frantic. I didn't mean to do that. I just happened to be up. I was having fun. When they told that to me, I realized that that level privilege was being used inappropriately by me. So now I schedule my emails, and I click send later, and then they go out at 9 or 10 a.m. on a Monday. It was a small adjustment in my behavior that changed my interactions with the team. But that level of privilege can also be used for good. If I'm going to be in a room with someone, I can sponsor them. I could say, you know, Guthrie wants to hear about some new thing in Azure. Hey, Heather, why don't you come along? You're into that stuff. Why don't we go together? I can do that an unlimited number of times. I will never run out until I get fired. Uh, <laughs> trust me. I, I'm shocked my badge still works at this point. Um, I can keep bringing people into rooms. And I can say, yeah, actually, you know, I think, I think Franco was doing that, or I think Maria was talking about that. Why don't, you, why don't you present your work? And you know what I do? I get the hell out of the way. I let them shine. I'm making luck. Now, not all of them are prepared. But I'm only half of the equation, Right? We help people get prepared through sponsor mentorship, and then we create luck through sponsorship. And there's a spectrum of what that means. Sponsorship spectrum can be, I'm going to mentor you. It can mean, we're going to sit down and we're going to make a strategy. What's our goal? We're going to get you promoted this year. We have a, a focused goal, like a scrum for promotion. I'm going to connect you to people. Somebody said today, wow, you know a lot of people. I, I took that as, wow, you're hella old. Um, but I do. I've been known Magnus for freaking 20 years, right? You know, he's still 29, but still. Um, yeah, you are old. Um, that, that we know people. What's the point of knowing people if you don't use that power to introduce people to each other? How cool is that, right? Then opportunity giver. Hey, you know, there's a great new conference happening in Copenhagen. Why don't you go and you should speak? I'll put in a good word for you. Costs me nothing. And it only means good things. Advocating, talking about people when they're not in the room is super powerful, especially when you're talking nice about them. Also, acknowledging that a mentorship relationship doesn't have to be permanent. 
It doesn't have to be awkward, like, are we getting married? Are we hanging? Do I have to mentor you forever? You can literally say, what's the goal here? Oh, I want to learn Python. Oh, I want to learn SharePoint. Oh, I want to learn Teams app. Okay, we can do that in about four months. Let me, let's meet twice a month for the next four months, and then we'll reevaluate at the end of that period. We can mentor in phases. Additionally, at work, make sure that you're not mentoring people in your direct line. You can't mentor people who work for you. You're their boss, but you can mentor people diagonally, and you can be mentored by people diagonally. So find variants of yourself in the future or the past diagonally within your org. And also acknowledge that it's not a regularly scheduled lecture. You're going to learn from them as much as they're going to learn from you. So I've got about, I think, about 15 minutes left. I'm going to tell a couple of, of fun stories that I like to talk about around tech. And I'm telling them only because I like telling them, but because I want you to be thinking about all of your fun stories that you can then share with your mentees and the people in your life because um, these are mine and you have yours and you're probably not telling them enough. You're not talking to enough people. You're not going to enough community events and sharing your stories, whether it be on your blogs, on your TikToks, on your Twitter, on your Mastodons. I think you want to be out there talking about stuff. So people ask me, what should you work on? What should you focus on? I usually say SharePoint. No, just kidding. Um, I always thought of it as a kind of a Swiss Army knife because it's a funny little knife and it's just not, it's not really good at anything. It's just, but it's, uh, it's a kind of a crappy pair of scissors, but you can do so much with it. In all seriousness, though, my dad gave me a Swiss Army knife, and this is the power, this is why the Swiss Army is the power they are today. It's the Swiss Army knife. That's a joke. There should be someone Swiss here. It should be like, really? Um, <laughs> The Swiss Army knife is actually on my desk, and it reminds me that I'm a T-shaped developer. You ever heard that term, T-shaped? Broad understanding of a lot of things and deep understanding of one thing, like the letter T. I know a lot, well, a little about a lot, and then I know a lot about the open web, and that's my thing, right? I'm a good knife. I don't skimp on the basics. So whenever I am mentoring people, whenever I'm telling stories about what you should do to get in start and, and started in tech, I usually start with these four things. Problem solving, layering, composing solutions, and patterns. Because no matter what piece of technology you're going to pick, if you know about these things, you're going to keep coming back to them. So if we look at something like problem solving as a start, problem solving is just asking yes, no questions at scale. That's all it is. And we find ourselves with senior engineers where it's like, how did you solve that problem so quick? I knew which questions to ask to chop the problem in half, and that's how I answered it. So I was doing this thing recently in the US at Black Girls Code, and I was talking to a bunch of 14 and 15-year-old girls in high school. And they were like, hey, we're learning how to code. This guy from Microsoft, hey, kids, let's learn how to code. We, da, 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 da. So I show up, and I'm like, hey, kids, my toaster's broken. Because you got to make it real awkward, because kids love, kids love cringe. Right? You make it super awkward. And like, OK, uh, Microsoft guy, I want to learn how to code. Well, that's great, but I want toast. So now we have two problems. Um, how are we going to solve this toast situation? And they're like, well, I don't know, buy a new toaster. And I said, that's simple thinking, kid. You suck. Stop it. <laughs> uh, Got to motivate the young people. No, I said, you know, what you do is you say, well, that, that would be a way. We could buy a new toaster, but let's think about the system that the toaster exists within. What's a better way to think about this? I put bread in, and toast is not coming out. Let's solve this. And one of them says, well, is the power on? All right, now we've just cut the problem in half. Is the power on? Is the power not on? OK, cool. The power is not on. I don't see that the toast is coming out. I'm not getting any power on this toaster. Somebody says, well, maybe plug in something else. Plug in a lamp. That's a pretty cool idea. Think about how, how quickly the problem moved away from hot bread. I want toast, and now we're plugging lamps in, right? Pretty soon it's going to be DNS, and then we're going to have a whole other problem, right? <laughs> then one of the young ladies says, well, maybe did you blow a fuse? Now we're, in the gar now we're in the garage, and we're flipping fuses? I just want bread. Well, is there any power on at all? These are really good questions, kids. Good job. And then one young lady who hadn't said anything yet, she says, do the neighbors have power? 
I want toasted bread, and she says I should peek outside and see if the neighbors have power. No, they don't. There's a power outage. You solved the problem. I wanted toast. The power is out in the entire neighborhood. Now, these are high school kids, so they're assuming it's an EMP or there's an aliens and the, you know, there's zombie apocalypse and you're not getting any toast. But that's a programmer. If, you, if I said, why is my toaster broken? And you said, do the neighbors have power? You're a coder. You're, meant, you're born to be a programmer. The difference between early in career and later in career people is that early in people, early in career people Google for stuff. And later in career people can ask one question and eliminate an entire class of problems. And why can we do that? Because we stuck around. Because we had a safe environment, a safe company, both psychologically safe and team-wise safe, where I could ask questions without being thought of as being dumb. The best bosses are the ones that say there are no dumb questions. Everybody's worried about getting the bozo bit flipped on them. Do you know what the bozo bit is? You ever heard of bozo the clown? You know when you flip a bit, you flip it from zero to one. It's really hard to flip bits back. And if someone flips the bozo bit on you, we're all afraid of this, is when you ask a question in a meeting. What does that acronym mean? DNS? Oh, domain name services. He doesn't know what domain, oh my God, how did, we, how did he get past the tech screen? Why is this person here? I've just flipped the bozo bit on that person and I'm never gonna think, it doesn't really exist. We need to stop feeling like that, that people are going to think that that one question that we should have known. I, I will lend my privilege by asking what that acronym is. I tell, and you can do this too, here's a tip. Tell early in career people when you're on a Teams meeting, that they can text you, they can teams you privately, they can back channel you and say, what does is, what is codename Project Brown mean? I don't know, I'll ask, I'll ask, because they can't fire me for asking that question and you won't feel bad. You see how that works? You lend your privilege to them and you have unlimited privilege to, end, to lend. So as our famous uh, American president, Abraham Lincoln said, it is always DNS. Um, I heard that on the internet. I heard on Twitter, actually, that's true. Uh, he's verified, so I know it's him. And uh, I made a list on the left here of all of the things that I could potentially check if a website was down. And I just wanted to point that out. It's just a list of stuff. I made that without Googling for anything. I just knew the list. And there's a probably 50 or more things. And I also put one in there that my kids wanted me to put in where it says, it's never twins. You know what that reference is? In Sherlock Holmes, uh, usually what happens is there's like a wedding and then the wife kills the groom and then they say, oh, well, the wife killed the groom, but she was on the other side of town at the same time. She has an alibi, you know, and he says, Holmes, could it have been twins? No, it's never twins. There's just certain things in tech that it's just never, never that thing, right? It's always DNS and it's never certain things. So knowing that stuff as a technologist is hugely helpful and it allows you to bifurcate, bisect the problem. Problem solving. Nothing that we talked about there was technical. Would have applied to any of the products that we know and love. Now, layering is another thing I love to talk about. Layering is vertical, hiding complexity, but layering is also lying. Right? Any, what did they say? Uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's a famous Arthur C. Clarke quote, right? Each additional layer of abstraction is indistinguishable from magic, right? If you have an API, you just put another API on top of it. Just lie to the previous API. That's what layering is all about. But what we don't realize is what's underneath matters. And if we just take a few minutes to understand one layer below our comfort zone, we will be better people. So if someone tells me, well, I don't want to learn all the way down to assembly language, that's okay. What's under SharePoint? What's under Teams? What's under the browser? Here's email. We've all seen email before, right? Here's me sending an email, the big ass file. Have you ever looked behind, we all send email. Has anyone ever looked at the protocol for email? Like one, one head nodded, two. It's simple. Right? Let's write it from scratch. Let's flip it around. Here's, here's email. Looks like 
name value pairs. Funny little thing about programming in 30 years of coding, you know what the entire world is built on top of? Name value pairs. Sometimes it's a colon, sometimes it's a hyphen, sometimes it's a comma. It's all name value pairs, right? All turtles all the way down. Look at lines 13 and 18 there where you've got this multi-part mime type boundary. You might say, okay, that's interesting. Why are you showing me that, Hanselman? Well, that's an HTTP post. Multi-part MIME type boundaries, name value pairs. You've all seen a form post before. That's email. That's a form post. It's the same thing. Now, you might just file that information away and you'll never use it again. But if you're debugging something and you're going to go and learn that, wow, it's the same. Maybe I already knew it. HTML is text that goes over HTTP over port 80. Email is text that goes over port 25. It's the same thing. The thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right. Oh, it's a hard drive, and it's got eight terabytes. Oh, it's a vinyl record. It's circles that spin on an internal axis that's got data encoded circularly that has a head that drops down. One is a diamond head, and one is a magnetic head. It's the same thing. A Blu-ray is fundamentally the same concept as a record player from 150 years ago. Knowing that historical context can make you more powerful. It fires all the neurons and you realize that, oh my God, it's the wheel. It's all the same. And you can start composing things. You can start putting things together and realizing that these layers snap together into larger systems. Now there's a show on Netflix called Altered Carbon. You ever seen Altered Carbon? You know this show? Oh, freaking amazing, fantastic show. In the show, there's uh, the, 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 the good guy, races to a hotel to, he needs help. And the hotel is in the future, and the hotel is an AI. And Edgar Allan Poe is an AI who manages the hotel, and the hotel is called the Raven. And, uh, you know, you see and Anthony Mackie on the right there, who's Captain America, and then you see this other guy. That other guy is Chris Connor. He's a character actor, and he plays Poe. And everyone who saw Altered Carbon, and I'm sure you will all agree, he stole every scene. It wasn't even fair. He'd shoot him up. He's a character actor. He's not famous famous. You can see him at, like, Whole Foods or, like, at those, hey, that's Chris Carr. How's it going? You know, I don't want to bother you. He's not Anthony Mackie. But he killed it. So I like to go on Twitter, and I talk to second-level actors, because they'll always answer you. I could text Anthony Mackie. He's not going to answer me. He's got a million followers. But when I see somebody like Chris, who's a re an actor's actor, I'm like, you're freaking amazing. I said, I saw Altered Carbon, and you're so cool. Da, 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 thanks to God. And I just gushed, because he was awesome. And I tweet him. And he tweets back, thanks, God, da, 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 da. And I see Portland, Oregon. I'm in Portland, Oregon. He's in Portland, Oregon? So there's a potential bromance here. <laughs> so you got to shoot your shot, right? Because you miss all the shots you don't take. So I said, are you in Portland? I am in Portland. Do you like tacos? I do like tacos. Would you like to have tacos with me? I would like. So then I freaking go and hang out with Chris Connor. And ah, look at this. He, this, man, this man shows up for our date with a vest, and an ascot. I wouldn't even think to put those things together, and he looked like an, an actor. I just looked, showed up like a schmuck, uh, and this guy's got a freaking, you know, garrot or whatever here. So we do a podcast, and I take my portable recorder, my Zoom recorder with an SD card, and we do a podcast, and we put lightning in a bottle, baby. Fantastic. We're vibing. We're talking. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. How am I going to tell my wife that I'm breaking up with her for this actor? Uh, so I leave and I go home and I put the SD card in the computer and here's what I find. I want you to take brief note, technical people in the room, uh, to this folder structure here. This is an infinitely recursing series of folders that have no name, not even a space. They just are nothingness that, re that refer to themselves multiple times. So what do I do? 
do I call my guy and I go, hey, I uh, kind of a famous technical person at Microsoft, uh, and I have lost the files. There's no way to recover from that. Do I move to another town, right? Do I change my name? I own the domain. I don't want to change my name. Do I block his number? There's no way this is going to go well. So I have to find these files. So I start digging around, and I note that you can right-click on Windows Explorer and say properties, and I can see that there's it thinks there's 340 megabytes on the disk, but the files aren't there. I don't know anything about low-level stuff. I'm a web programmer, but I know how to read. So I start digging around, and I learn all about comp composition and layering, and I learn about file allocation tables, and I find out that that number is supposed to be that other number, and these things aren't working, and it takes me hours. And I'm doing all of this to avoid the shame of telling him <laughs> that I've lost these files. Turns out the files are on the disk, but the file allocation table is corrupted, and I can't fix it. So I have to manually rebuild the file allocation table with a hex editor. Now, if you ever want to feel like a ninja on a computer, just open a hex editor. You'll be like, Whoop -ah! it's fantastic. So I find the files, and I pull them back out, and the show is up, and Chris doesn't know. And he'll never know because he's never going to watch this. And we still hang out. He's a super cool guy. Nothing in the computer is hidden from you. I don't care if you're a power platform developer. If you chose to, you need to know this about yourself, you could go all the way to the bottom. You could go all the way down and discover that computers are just rocks that we shot with lightning to make them think. That's what it is. It's like, hey, let's get some silicon. Hey, let's put some lightning in there. Oh, my God, it thinks. And it's a miracle it works. Believe me, the deeper you go, the more you realize that none of this should ever work. It's a miracle that it's working at all. Um, I am not, I'm a web developer. I do text boxes over data, but I needed to dig down this one day, and I did, and you can too. So I tell people that it's important. And then finally, patterns. Why are really good programmers really good? Because they saw it before. And how do we give the younger, the earlier in career, the new, the career switchers, the ability to be successful in tech is they have to stick around. We have to not chase them out of tech. My superpower is having been doing this for 30 years, and I can go, oh, yeah, let me tell you about the great cookie wars of the early 90s, and then I talk all about how we solved that before. I want them to have stories like that, and the way that we do that is we make them have comfortable, psychologically safe teams where they can make these mistakes, take down production, so everyone has a I took down production story, uh, and then bring it back because we have DevOps, right? So I uh, spent 13 hours once debugging a segmentation fault in .NET on a Raspberry Pi, um, which brings me back to my favorite topic, hex editors. Do you see the problem? It's obvious, isn't it? No, it was not obvious. That's why it took 13 hours to debug this problem. Uh, the one on the left is good, and the one on the right is bad. Turns out there's some missing holes on the one on the right. You can see them. I've marked them in red. And over here, they're missing. Zero D. You know how I said that everyone Googles for stuff? You can't Google your way out of this, kids. The only, the only one way that you can ever figure this out is that you saw it before. And someone saw it before, and someone saw it before, and Adam and Eve had this problem with their PC early on, and it went through the storytelling. Does anyone know what zero D is? What? Carriage return. Why do you know? Because you're old. <laughs> <laughs> zero D is a carriage return. So I go to a young person at work, and I say, zero D, that's a carriage return. And they said, what's a carriage, and where is it returning to? <laughs> Well, it turns out when you FTP a file without an extension, it gets treated as a text file. And because it was on Windows, which uses carriage return line feed after every line, and you move it to a Linux machine like a Raspberry Pi, it strips out the carriage return and leaves only the line feed. It treated the binary file as a text file, and it pulled out the zero Ds, carriage returns from the Smith Corona typewriters of the, of the day, 
Where have I seen that before? Well, there, well, kids, there's a thing called a carriage. It carries the paper. And it goes, do, 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 ding, line feed, return. Literally, get, get problems with get in 2022 are related to whether or not we use a carriage return and a line feed on a typewriter uh, or a Lego typewriter. Uh, uh, pander to the Denmark audience, uh, Lego typewriter. Uh, and then, of course, I make the young person put together the Lego typewriter because they can't work at the company if they haven't done this one at least once. The point is that once we can put all these things together, we can do a bunch of crazy stuff. I'm going to skip past these slides here because it doesn't really matter and I'm running out of time and I want to give you homework. What are your fun stories? How can they be told in a way that encourages and lifts up your mentees and the people that you are sponsoring? Do they humanize tech? Remember that good stories don't punch down. They don't make anyone look dumb but you. All of my stories are about how dumb I am, not about how dumb you are. You'll know that on your own. And then how can you teach them to share their own stories? Thank you so much for hanging out with me, and I hope that you're loving this show as much as I am. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you.